Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. So, really quick, I ran into someone yesterday um, who mentioned that, oh, guess what? It's the Buddha's birthday this weekend. And I went, oh, it oh. is. And then I thought, okay, excellent. So I put out this birthday candle. Um, but then um, I, someone said to me that it wasn't necessarily his birthday, it was the date of his enlightenment. Uh, I don't know which one it is. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Um, uh, the full moon of, of Vesak, and I mean, so many cultures worldwide, it's, it's like these cycles of the moon. And it's very visceral. So it's actually a celebration of his birth, his enlightenment, and his death, all in one full moon. <laughs> so we don't have to remember a lot. <laughs> Just May full moon, basically. Okay, so it's an all-purpose candle. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Which, by the way, the flame is good, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 it's a major. Anyway, we usually, we usually begin our day, we usually begin our day um, introducing ourselves, saying our names, and how about you begin with for us? I'm Jason. I'm Jesse. My name is Michael. My name is Gary, Silas, Greg, Lee, Don, Jim, John. My name is Brian, Michael, Michael, David, Larry. My name is Jeff, <coughs> Jack, Vince, George. I'm Brad. My name is Tim. My name is David. I'm Jim, Lucretia, Peter, Tom, Richard. I'm Hal. I'm Richard. Jay. Hello. And my name is Roy. And we don't have a newsletter, so I'm going to read your bio from here. So bear with me. <laughs> we'll tell me. Okay. So Heather Sumber, who is a friend of our Sangha and really a Sangha member, you know. I'm so honored. <laughs> really. Heather's been teaching meditation, um, has began uh, teaching meditation in 1999. She has completed the four years the four year Spirit Rocks Insight Meditation Society teacher training, beginning her own meditation practice in her late teens for twenty plus years. Heather has studied with senior teachers in the Insight Meditation and Tibetan traditions and has sat one to three months of retreat a year for the last fifteen plus years. She is a teacher for Mountain Stream Meditation Center in the Sierra Foothills and also teaches classes, day-longs, and retreats nationally, especially at Spirit Rock Meditation Center. She also has her own website, heathersunberg.com. Welcome, Heather. <laughs> well done reading that off your phone. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 to be honest with you, the last time I mentioned heathersunberg.com, you kind of laughed and made this joke. So I thought, should I say it or not? But no, I'm going to say it. <laughs> and it's funny. I giggled that time, too. I mean, it, it's just, it's so amusing. You know? it's like, we need to use this technology in order to create access. And then we're talking about the spiritual path, and it just, it's, it's hysterical to me. You know, it's like... Good, bad, who knows? None of the above. It just kind of is how it is. If we didn't have a website or links to find out about this, how would you find out about this? Hmm. So it's very good to be back. It's so good to see you all. Uh, I'm uh, just coming back here. Uh, what? I came back a few weeks ago from some what I call sabbatical time. Like you have to put titles on things so that you can say something to somebody about what you're doing. So I use this title sabbatical. So what does that mean? Um, for me, it usually means a process of, of going deep in, inside and deep into retreat. So I spent five weeks uh, in tremendous solitude and silence in the woods uh, on self-retreat. And then I had three days at home to pack a suitcase and 
came down to SFO, grabbed a plane, and flew off to Colombo, Sri Lanka. Why not? <laughs> you know, it's out there. Why not? Might as well go. Uh, Sri Lanka is a, a Theravadan Buddhist country, and, and the insect meditation that we practice in the West comes out of that tradition. I had never been. So I thought, you know, it would be a real privilege to go ooh, soak up those roots you know, but also in a culture that is in a tremendous amount of change because uh, the civil war is over in Sri Lanka. Hooray. You know, it's been over for a number of years now. And so it's a very interesting situation where on one hand I would say that as a, as a country there's a sense that it's 30 years behind due to that civil war and the violence and the way that it broke down the infrastructure. And on the other hand there's this newness, this freshness Things are moving really fast there. So in terms of like living there and being there, all of a sudden you'll get in this context where you go, oh, this is kind of familiar from a developed country like the United States, although I'm not sure that the entirety of the United States we could call a developed country, <laughs> but you know, just generally, generally speaking. Uh, and then you sort of fall, and then the, the floor falls out from under you, and you're like, wait a second, am I in India? You know, like what's going on. And of course, even India, you can't say some of it. I've spent time with Indians in India that are so much better off than I'll probably ever be in terms of um, economics and then, of course, the poverty. So it's just not one thing. Nothing is. Have you noticed? It's really easy to just say something is something, but it's really more than that. Came back a few weeks ago. Now I'm here. And uh, happy to be back in the Bay Area, you know, my other home. So, um, you know, one of the things about coming back from sabbatical, it's, it's this process, and it's a process we all recognize whether we've done something called a sabbatical or not, whether we've done something called a retreat or not, because on the spiritual path and just the experience of being human, I'm sure we've noticed this, there's these cycles of what I call kind of going within or withdrawal from complexity, being in simplicity, and then out of that re-engaging, reconnecting, um, moving it out, manifesting, and we just cycle it. We move in and it's simple and we move out and express and give back and we move in and we move out. That's been my whole spiritual path. You could say that I do it a little bit more extreme than some people do. A lot of people don't go spend weeks and months in total silence and not seeing anybody. But, you know, that's just been my journey. And it's not better or worse. I just think about Sunday mornings. We come here, we turn off the cell phone. That alone is a withdrawal and an invitation into simplicity where there's more opportunity to connect with the person who's actually <coughs> physically in front of us. I'm touched every time I come here with um, the way that you greet each other and see each other. And when I watch you greet each other and see each other, I feel welcome and I feel seen. And I think it's contagious in the best of ways. I'm sure I'm not the only one that feels that way. When we're bearing witness to people treating each other with the kind of integrity and respect that human beings deserve, it lights up something in us, you know. Here I've got this uh, candle representing the light of Vesak, the Buddha's birth and, and enlightenment and passing on. And it's like, yeah, there's so many ways to light that candle and then pass it. And we just keep passing it. So for me, um, also being kind of an introvert by nature, and then spending my whole life in community, which is really good for balance for me. It's really important to both go into deep silence and also to go to places where nobody knows me. We call it anonymity. So I walk around on the planet and it's like nobody knows who I am. Therefore, I don't have to be who I am. It gives me space to see who I am today, not who I was before, but who I am in this fresh moment, and then be seen in that fresh moment. In fact, when I'm in Buddhist Asia, I don't even go, I certainly don't go by Heather Sunberg. That's way too long a name. And I don't even go by Heather. 
because in most of those languages, TH and R are super hard to say. And so when I first go over there, I'd say, you know, they ask you, well, who are you and where are you from? And where are you going? <laughs> I never know how to answer any of those. <laughs> but then I realize, you know, they're just trying to connect and we have limited language in common. It's not actually about the question. It's about the connection. It's like how in this culture we say, how are you? And how often do we find ourselves saying, I'm fine, how are you? That's not what's really happening. That's the verbalization. But what's really happening is somebody's reaching out and we're allowing ourselves to reach our hand out also. This whole thing about, you know, I mean, shaking hands actually has an interesting history, but the reaching out with a question and then the reaching back. So they say, you know, what is your name? Where are you from? Where are you going? And I say, I'm Hedda. I'm Hedda. Because when I used to say, I'm Heather, they get this perplexed look and start stumbling. And I know what it's like to try to say a name that's not familiar in my culture. It's like, let's just make it easy so we can connect. So I just walk around, Hedda, Hedda, Hedda. You know? Who am I? What are these labels? Sabbatical. What does that mean? It's a label. But it means something. We can all agree on it. You know that it didn't mean I was working 90 hours a week. So yes and no. You know, it's like you ask the question, is, it, is the Buddha's birth, is the Buddha's enlightenment? Yes. <laughs> so it's been fun to come back. And I'm sort of just, I'm just at the, t maybe the tail end of what I would call the, um, the awkwardness period of coming back into teaching. I've actually been teaching my whole life. I've been teaching in classrooms since I was 15 years old. I had my own classroom before I was 20. Um, so it doesn't really matter what I'm teaching, it's just the process of teaching and the relationship with that and the art of that. And so what I know is that when I don't do it for a while, it gets kind of rusty. I mean, they say that if you don't use it, you lose it. So choose your thing that you don't use so often and then you go back to it and you go, oh, it's not quite as familiar. And the good news is it's not quite as automatic. That's lovely. And I was noticing coming back a certain amount of what I would, two things. One I would call an awkwardness and the other I would call um, kind of a self-consciousness. A little bit too aware of me in the process of teaching. And kind of this sense of like, okay, I'm supposed to be up here saying something. What is this all about? So it's interesting, we talk about mindfulness, and of course, bringing awareness is such an important thing. But there are near misses of that awareness. And I would call this like a near miss, where there was too much awareness in a particular way that actually wasn't helping the situation. <laughs> because I was a little bit too involved in my own process, and then I was like, who's out there? Let me connect, hi, here we are together. And I think we go through that in our relationships, in our work, where we're just like doing this balance of, again, withdrawal and connection, and withdrawal and connection, and sometimes it gets a little off. We can be aware of that. We can be transparent about that, either internally, if we feel safe enough externally, I feel really safe with you guys. It's external. And to actually have the respect and the wisdom to know when to be transparent more internally and where externally and with whom and in what context. Because we've all done it where we've been super transparent in actually a context that couldn't hold it in that feeling. This is discernment. So I've been coming back, kind of moving through the awkwardness and and all of this, and, and just enjoying looking at notes and talks and quotes, and um, so everything's fresh. And in fact, somebody sent me over email a couple of days ago the perfect poem for where I'm at, so I thought I'd share it. I love uh, Naomi Shihab Nye, and she's the one that wrote Kindness. Um, and this one's uh, it's from You and Yours, and it's called Fresh. To move cleanly needing to be nowhere else, wanting nothing from any store, to lift something you already have and set it down in a new place. 
awakened eye seen freshly. What does that do to the old blood moving through its channels? So I love that because this whole thing about illumination. What's important isn't Vesak and the full moon. What's important is that we understand that we're in rhythm with these cycles of full illumination and full darkness being known. And that people come together in community and say, this means something, and there's an energy and a power to that. The eyes awaken. When I'm in communities and cultures that aren't familiar to me, I can see differently. The perception of me and what I know and what I see and what I can label breaks down. And I get to be open to something more than that. And it's why I go into retreat. It's why I travel. It's why I stay in community. And maybe you do too. So, huh. I was laughing with a couple of you before we started. That's why I wandered in just barely on time. And I was saying, you know, I brought two whole Dharma talks for today. And I was laughing and saying, I don't think I'm going to give either of them. Because there's a time for container. There's a time for linear thinking. And there's a time to just trust. Just trust what's available. Trust what's unfolding. Trust the moment to actually provide what's needed and how to respond. And I'm very much in the latter right now. So coming back to this culture was fascinating. It's fascinating whether we go backpacking for a week and everything's off when we come back, or we leave the country, or we go to a different part of the country, or we're just with a group of people that are, have totally different views than we do. You know? And how do we like hold that in friendliness? We don't have to agree. So I came back, and here were the two headlines, right? Over here, Donald Trump, okay? It's like, really? Even bigger than before. You know, I'd sort of been out of it all, out of off, offline for two and a half months. And then over here, Zika. And I was like, okay. So there's a lot of drama. There's a lot of reactivity. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anger. And everybody is pretty consumed by this and getting hooked and getting tugged. And, of course, you know, I'm sure a few of you are thinking, I'm not hooked by this. It's like, good. We need people walking around not hooked by things. So please walk around not hooked by things. But it's like it's in the air. I feel like something's going on. I, I'll be interested to hear when we share, you know, what your thoughts are. It's, it's like we're in the middle of a cycle right now. And here's what we know. We know it's not about the headlines. It's not about Donald Trump or our opinion about Donald Trump, whatever it is. I just hope that we all go vote for whoever we go vote for coming up because I think every vote counts this time. Whoever it is, I think every vote counts every time, actually. So it's not about the actual headlines. It's about how we're relating to the headlines. And I mean, the meditation is no different. You're sitting there, minding your own business, and all these headlines are passing through, me and my life. And can we actually relax and go... Okay, these are the headlines. There's some drama, there's some obsession, there's some worry, there's some interest, there's some excitement. And they're just headlines passing through and the reaction passing through. And it can all be known in this awareness, which is completely available to know all of it. Now, that means we don't be trapped about whether we like or don't like either of those two headlines. We don't have to be trapped in it. We're just living in the response, the headlines and the response to the headlines. You start to choose in my own mind or on the news. How am I going to engage this thing? When am I going to feed it and turn it on? When am I going to educate myself about my own inner process and say, let's figure out how this worry thing works. It seems to come often. Let's think about this a little bit. What triggers it? And how can I relax around those triggers so that it doesn't have to do that whole arc 
for five days before it passes away. I was uh, talking to somebody in one of my communities, old 12-stepper. And she was saying, yeah, you know, one of the things I've learned in Dharma and in 12 steps is that I have these triggers. And when I get triggered by them, I can actually now see it and make a choice. And I often ask myself a question. I say to myself, hey, do I need to have a thing about this for the rest of the day? Do I need to have a thing about this for the whole weekend? Could I have a thing about this for five minutes only? And she says for her, it actually um, creates some space to be in relationship with that thing she's having to think about so that the choice is more available. And what she was talking about, she said earlier on, on both of her spiritual paths, she didn't see it. She didn't know what the catalyst was. And it would just go on all weekend, metaphorically speaking. We've all had that happen. So there were also some great, more kind of closer to home headlines. One of my favorite coming back, and, and I'm sure you're very pleased about this too, was finding out that Larry got voted in as the Grand Marshal um, coming up for, um, for gay pride, right? And I was just like, I was so happy for him. So happy for him. Um, or at least that was the headline that I heard. I didn't hear it from him. Is it true? Yes. Good. Yay. <laughs> you know, I was at Spirit Rock yesterday, passing through, and they're about to open the new community center. And it's all done. And it's the most exquisite thing. It's like how many people's hearts and hands and vision and finances and skills came together to manifest this thing that's going to last for generations. And so what I'm seeing, maybe you're seeing it too, is there's this huge increase in awareness happening right now in this culture. All kinds of different things. Um, huge, huge increase in awareness. And it's almost as if um, in the energetic arts they talk about equal and opposite actions. And so one action is this total raising of awareness in places that, like, really, 10 years ago, would you have ever guessed that um, our transgender community would be so much in the news and that so much awareness would be being raised? I mean, you know more than I do. Maybe you would have guessed. But I'm just, you know, I know there's equal and opposite action with it. But it's really, really inspiring and touching that the awareness is being raised. And then there's the opposite action. And the opposite action is the reactivity. So awareness is being raised with a lot of different things, and the reactivity is equal and opposite. And I feel like it's the invitation to communities like ours to actually um, up our ante, to sit in the center of these equal and opposite actions and not get so blown, to have clarity about, this is increased awareness. Maybe I don't like the actual headline. Maybe it's not even skillful. But here's the part that's increased awareness. And here's the part where there's the reactivity. How do I settle my nervous system down so I can have more clarity? How do I stay connected and not isolated so I can have more clarity? What is it that I can do to meet this situation to bring more clarity today? We're really being invited into that individually in communities and across the globe. And it totally inspires me. But in the Buddhist tradition, the way we talk about equal and opposite action is we would talk about, I love that this candle's here and this Vesak, we talk about illumination, the little ways we wake up, the big ways we wake up. And I mean all levels. We awaken in our bodies, we awaken psychologically, we uh, awaken around you know, issues of injustice, we awaken in the mind, we awaken energetically. Every way, there's this constant process of awakening happening. But we have to have the mindfulness growing into maturity so that we can actually see and orient to the awakening happening, because I know how it looks. We're just sitting in traffic again. Mm -hmm. You know, literally and metaphorically. It's like being back in the Bay Area. I've gotten caught in four major traffic jams in the last 72 hours. Where I live, that doesn't happen. You know? 
And it happens in our minds, and it happens on the road, and it's just ho-hum, and we're tired after work, and where the heck is the awakening? The awakening in those moments, I think, is so simple. It's like seeing, I've had a really long day, and instead of just turning on the screen or whatever your version of it is, we have that moment of recognition. I'm exhausted. I'm going to do something for self-care before I turn on the screen. And I have some compassion that I care about what I was doing today to the amount that I do, and I did the best I could, and so I'm not going to judge myself for being tired. These are all little illuminations. The candle is getting brighter. But here's the thing about illumination. And here's the thing about waking up. And I've been really working with this since this sabbatical, since this retreat, since this journey, because it's equal and opposite action. And, you know, it was a very powerful retreat for me this year. It was a very powerful trip in Sri Lanka. Um, and so I'm really having to see coming back here. That's why I like the poem Fresh. Who am I? Because some things have changed. But then the question is, how much have they changed? And when the going gets hard, and it's close to the bone, and my back's up against the wall, what's there? You know, what's really there? And so in the Buddhist tradition, we talk about waking up and um, the remainder, what remains. Because we've all had this happen, you know? We have some psychological insight. We go, wow, that family of origin thing. It's never going to hook me the same way. And then what does it do? It comes back around and hooks us the same way. We go, what went wrong? I got so clear. And the answer is yes. The answer is yes, it woke up. Yes, there's an illumination. But there was a remainder. I think about it like, like the earth, right? And things growing. It's spring. So you have this whole kind of tree of self-judgment, say, or other judgment, or just judgment in general. This whole tree, right? And you're growing it and watering it with more judgments, the sunlight of the culture's judgments, and that thing's just growing like a weed, right? Then we start pruning. With care, with love, we're pruning this thing. Like, do I really need this part? This part's, you know, it sort of like starts to diminish, starts to diminish. But then there's the, the underworld, the <laughs> roots, right? And so what I've really come to see is number one, and please look and see for yourself and verify this for yourself, but I'm going to say this because the confidence was reassuring for me when my teacher said it, and I really knew they meant it. This shit works. Okay? <laughs> they didn't say it that way because they're not my generation, my teachers. Okay? This practice works. It doesn't work the way we thought it would work. It doesn't work in the time frame we thought. It doesn't, like, nothing that I thought about this is how it's been. But it does work. And then I say, okay, so whatever has been released in me, whatever has been untangled in me, the Buddha talks about untangling the tangle. Do you know that? That tangle? Do you have a tangle? Everybody's got a tangle. Yeah. It's bringing in awareness and mindfulness. To like, where is it tangled now? And where is it knotted within the tangle now? You know? Is it a difficult emotion that just keeps coming back or an area of your life you just kind of can't quite get traction with in terms of whatever, untangling the tangle. And so it untangles. And so what I say is, you know, things illuminate, things release, they untangle, they relax, they open. And the truth of the matter is, is if you give us the perfect set of just horrible, uh, maybe traumatizing, upsetting, triggering, like everything that could possibly go wrong goes wrong, we will see the echo, we will experience the echo and kind of what remains in the subterranean level. And it will pop its head up like a weed, and it'll look so real, but it's not the same. It's not the same because we actually see that that's what's happening. So yeah, it could be triggering, we could be upset, we could be acting out the same old way. I think of it like a car, right? And sometimes we're able to change a habit pattern. And it's looking really good. It's like, yeah, I had that habit pattern, and now I don't. And then, uh-oh. We get hit again by life. There it is. What do I do now? 
And it's like we've had the foot on the gas of the habit pattern for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I don't know how many years. Pedal to the metal on that habit pattern. And then we, you know, it untangled. And we took the foot off the gas. But that car, it's still moving. It's moving fast. And so sometimes it looks like nothing changed. But it did. Be on the lookout for that. It counts. It totally counts. And really having compassion with the momentum of the echo of things, you know, all the different things that you used to be when you were younger, and now you're not, but you still hear the echo every once in a while. It's like, no, it's okay. Cars just hasn't quite stopped yet. Speaking of echo. There's an echo. So once upon a time, to go along with the music, once upon a time, a long, long time ago, the Buddha was walking. And as he was walking, he was being chased by Angulimala. You know Angulimala? Okay, Angulimala was like one of the archetypes of, mm, you know, darkness. Archetype of darkness. He was actually an ardent spiritual practitioner that got some really, really bad spiritual advice from a teacher didn't have enough maturity in his own spiritual practice to see it as bad advice. And out of that, a series of events actually led to him being a mass murderer. This is why we both need teachers and fundamentally we need to be our own teacher. Because no one else, yeah, we need guidance, yeah, we need feedback, but nobody else can actually show us the way. We have to show ourselves the way. We do it together in community so that there, there are feedback loops. He became a mass murderer. And so he sniffed out the Buddha walking and said, ah, there's another one. And so he starts chasing the Buddha, chasing the Buddha. And as he's chasing the Buddha, the Buddha continues walking, lifting, moving, placing. And Angulimala can't catch him, no matter how fast he runs. So finally, Angulimala says to the Buddha, stop! And the, so that he can kill him. And the Buddha turns around and lands his gaze on Angulimala and says, Angulimala, I have stopped. It's you, friend, who needs to stop. Well, we don't know when somebody's going to turn around and like cut through all of our BS and we just see. And the thing is, is that it might be us turning around and cutting through and seeing. It might be a life circumstance turning around. And in fact, as practice matures, it's so much about the mind turning around and seeing itself, illuminating itself in its richness, its fullness, its humanness, and its awakeness. It actually turns around and sees itself. So all of a sudden the mirror is not reflecting on the headlines of Donald Trump and Zika and me and my main event and my dramas and my problems. But it's seeing its own true nature. It is not about the headlines. That, in a way, at that point, the car that was still moving after we took our foot off the habit pattern, it stops. And then what happens? It starts again because the world needs us in whatever level of illumination, whatever level that candle's lit. And I know for me and for you sometimes, this is such a beautiful, robust flame. And sometimes the flame is so small and it's flickering so hard, you think, man, is that thing going to go out? Is it going to go out? And what do I do if it does? No. I bet some of us think that sometimes it does. It's just a metaphor, so it doesn't matter whether it does or not. But I know in the darkest moments of my life, you know those moments? It's really dark. It's really, really dark. And yet, something knows the darkness. What is that thing? Can it be an ally to re-illuminate so that we take the next breath, that we actually take it 
in the hardest moment of our life, we take the breath. We don't stop breathing. And we get up and we make ourselves another meal and we brush our teeth again. And it keeps going. It just keeps going. And it's, you know, it's okay. It's totally not okay, but it's okay. It's like that. It's like that. Kind of an intense place to end. It's a lot of awake, a lot of dark. Didn't use either talk. So, you know. If you didn't like it, then you have that total opportunity to like sit in the center of equal and opposite, right? Because <laughs> it's like, okay, then we're raising awareness about, I mean, you know, I've heard Dharma talks I didn't like. Uh-oh. <laughs> we're not supposed to talk about this. We're not supposed to talk about this. There are all kinds of things I don't like, right? And it's like, oh, raising the awareness. This is what it's like to like it. This is what it's like to not like it. And the mind turns and goes, this is the awareness that knows the liking and disliking. And that's actually where the freedom is, not the liking and disliking. So then we can bear the headlines in the news, we can bear the headlines in our own minds, because we go, oh, I've got a resource, I've got an ally. The awareness that knows all this. So then I can find some ground, I can settle down, and I can have that next appropriate response. You can do that next right thing, right? The 12-step tradition. I know some of you guys are 12-steppers, too. So, uh, again, I've just been liking this quote in the last few days of teaching. So it's from Ajahn Sumedho, one of the monastic elders in our tradition. And the way that he puts it is a little bit black and white, so I'm just... Acknowledging that, it makes for a good quote, but it's, I see everything as a continuum. So he says, the pain, the discomfort, the sickness, they are what they are. We can always cope with the way life moves and changes. The mind of an enlightened human being is flexible and adaptable. The mind of a person in ignorance is conditioned and fixed. And so I'm not interested in being an enlightened person or an ignorant person. What I'm interested in is that enlightenment moves through and ignorance moves through and they move into the foreground and they fall into the background and can I track, is conditioning and fixed in the foreground right now? Is it running the show of what I'm seeing and hearing and touching and tasting and thinking and how I'm interacting? Or is it more about the adaptability and flexibility. And it's just always moving, and that's completely fine. So, that's what I'm to offer for reflection, <laughs> for what it's worth. <laughs> and um, I really wanted to leave some time to hear your reflections. Heather? Yeah. Can you look at the flame right now? Look at it. Wow! <laughs> I know, it's amazing. Oh, how many of you saw the full moon either last night or even the night before? It was very full illuminated. How many of you yeah, saw it? It's good. Just like Buddha's birthday. Buddha's birthday, exactly. We were talking about that at the beginning. Yeah. So I mean, it's just it's just fluctuating, and we know that inside. And it's so, so important, this, this community's here, because I'm making a guess, but I'm making a guess based on my own experience. I mean, how many years have I been coming and teaching here? It's maybe like seven, eight years, even though it's not often. And all different kinds of things have happened to me, you know? And I come in here, and I'm wherever I am, and you greet me, and you see me, and you welcome me, and it just, like, lights it up a little bit more. It really matters. You light us up. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, what are your thoughts, please? Well, first of all, thanks for saying that about the uh, sangha, because I was feeling that a great deal during my visit. Mm -hmm. It's a great resource and a refuge. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate everyone here. And it just uh, reiterated, you re reiterated for me that this is all about the middle way, mm -hmm. the middle path. Mm -hmm. And I love that about the 
Buddhist teaching is that you you find a way to center yourself in the midst of the pain and the joy. Mm -hmm. And the more you allow all of it to be experienced, there's actually a way in which you become more centered, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's, and sometimes all of those extremes can really pull you exactly in every direction, both towards joy and towards difficulty. Mm -hmm. And somehow being in the center allows you to hold it all mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the duality. Yeah, because, and, and, you know, thank you. That was a really, actually, important add-on to the reflection. So first, I thank you. It's, like, super clear. Um, and it's like, yeah, sometimes the equal and opposite action, we literally feel like we're being pulled apart. You know, it's like, it's like the rack is back, and I'm on it. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, that old torture technique. You know? I mean, obviously, yeah, okay, let's not go there. <laughs> But, you know, so it literally like, feels like being pulled apart. And then there's a sense of, like, yeah, it's just equal and opposite actions. There's all this energy over here. There's all this energy over here. And there's this center place. And the, there can be a center place in the body that's felt physically. There's a center place energetically. There's a center place in the mind. When all those come together, it's like we can take incredible hurricane force winds. Um, and, you know, actually, we've stopped. You know, everyone else hasn't stopped, but in that moment we have. So then I get curious, how do you find the center point? The thing that we're labeling the center point, which is kind of dangerous because it's not, it's a label. Same way sabbatical is a label, head does a label. But how do you, what's it, what's it feel like to you? What's it look like to you? How do you find it? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Heather. It's good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Um, I've been struggling with the same thing. I recently came back for two week uh, road trip down in the southwest, and it was really, really good. And part of me is really glad to be back, but I find I'm also suffering. But I call it post ecstatic vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so finding that balance is is, uh, is a bit of an effort. Like mm -hmm. wanting to just sort of not do things, or you know. Or just spend more time more alone. I just like make an effort to re-engage. And the traffic jams are all there. And the buzz, right, internally, externally, both. Um, right. Yeah, right. The buzz of this, the Bay Area is incredibly intense. And suddenly, is. people are in competition for parking spaces and want to get around you. And mm -hmm. who's going to, you know, move out of the way on the sidewalk and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, but. Uh, but I, my mind wandered during meditation, and I remember uh, just, just thinking about the equal and opposite. It was a, a sign I saw on the freeway here uh, said, uh, for, to have for a club with some woman with black horns on it said, uh, just the right amount of bra. Just the right amount of bra. 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 No, bra. Wrong. Just the right amount of wrong. Oh, right? wrong! I thought you said wrong. I'm like, wrong. That's a really <laughs> weird sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we have, you know, the beast and right. exactly. the light. Exactly. Seeing, right? You know. Yeah, and that balanced place. Because we know, and I know you know, you know, it's this whole thing about not doing the spiritual bypass. Yes. It's like we've got, you know, Again, we're using language that doesn't really work. We've got shadow places. We've got undigested material. We've got internal difficulties, external difficulties. And, like, how to actually hold that in wholeness and in humanness, which is why I always reinterpret Ajahn Sumedho's quote that it's a continuum. You know? Because for me, this whole practice is about no part left out. And that, to me, the most important place of that is the part that I don't know I'm leaving out, mm -hmm. that, I, that I have unconscious bias about, that I'm not aware of, even that part not left out. And there's always going to be something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just the right amount of wrong, just yeah. the right amount of awake. <laughs> yeah. Then people trust us in our authenticity. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I'm sure some of us have known people who are like very, it was California, like so love and light in the foreground that you're like, is there anything else going on with this person? <laughs> and we've been that person sometimes, you know, so nobody's anything all the time. We're just cycling through. So what else on your guys' minds? Yeah, please. Thanks for your talk. Yeah. And, um, I, the, I want to put a plug in for you the shit works. Like, the shit works, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, I was thinking, like, I started meditation, a serious meditation practice when I ended my long-term relationship two, like, two and a half years ago. Mm. And, uh, and I'm just reflect. I'm, your talk made me think back, like, how do I know? It's changing, or how do I know it's working? Because yeah. it's subtle and it's weird, and sometimes it feels like it's working and it's not working. Like, yeah. Um, and I guess uh, so. I was thinking just like how how I've been through events mm -hmm. in my life and what I just went through, and I'm very obsessed because I'm a teacher and I'm obsessed with school and teaching. But yeah. Um, we had a graduation ceremony in Potluck um, Friday, and so I was thinking about how that's changed for me in these uh, couple of years, and. The, the light and the dark, because I work with a population who's like, um, so like in the classroom there are children who are like really violent and uh, yeah. behavior disordered, emotionally disturbed, yeah. and then there's like angelic and everything in between. Mm. And like, how are you present? How am I present for the, the right. whole range? <coughs> right. It's changed with meditation practice. Mm -hmm. And then at the pot, look, I had like 80 family members, you know, like. The room is just jam packed with people, and mm -hmm. some people are like, you know, good Catholic Filipino family, you know, quote unquote, and then there's like really extreme poverty, yeah. uh, you know, grandmother at 30. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah, no, like, I hear you. Mm -hmm. The light and the dark, and just yeah. being present in that. And um, how since the meditation practice has evolved, I've just been much more able to be yeah. in the center on, on, the, on the beam kind of, you know, yeah. in, in all that. Witness, being bearing witness and yeah. and being myself, like showing yeah. up in a fresh way. Exactly, you know, like, exactly. How am I going to show up at, how am I going to show up in the classroom today? How am I going to show up with my parents, with the parents today, mm -hmm. in a fresh way, mm -hmm. without, with less judgment, mm -hmm. with less anxiety, with less, mm -hmm. like, yeah, this whole internal, external, both that the Buddha taught about. You know, it's like it's like you've got your teacher, your muse, and your family life, and your work life. And then you look inside and you go, oh, it's the same continuum here. Like this whole thing of inside outside, and they're all muses for that same, you know, dynamic experience of balance. It's powerful. It's really powerful. And I've said this before. Thank you for doing that work. So uh, I think we need to close. Is that like the candle just went out. You're kidding. Me. <laughs> wow, this candle's really in no. sync with us. Oh, it's out. Oh, check it out. We better close fast before it goes out. But you know, when it goes out, that means that some other light is gonna shine more because we won't be illuminated by that. When I went out to look at the full moon in Berkeley last night, it was like so many lights, you know, and I just. I'm not an urban dweller anymore. Just like, whoa, you really have to orient to the light of the moon when there's so many other lights that are more bright. I mean, that is the metaphor for our practice. We're orienting towards something yeah. that isn't as obviously bright as the neon of our world, but man, there's something compelling there, isn't it? Because otherwise you'd be somewhere else right now. It's not that interesting. And it's like the most interesting thing that could possibly happen. <laughs> So, should we stand up? Is there one more? Is there one more? Tom, I, just, I don't know if it's a question, but I just, um, it's interesting because so I do the recordings and so I'm sitting here trying to like find a title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> this can be a trap. Right, right, right. That's kind of what you talked about. Exactly, you know, it's a label. <laughs> um, but I just want to say, in, you know, what I realize is that in some ways, rather than a defined message that's very linear. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your talks are very beautiful and more like poetry, mm -hmm. where I just have to like sort of absorb it and allow this feeling tone to wash over me, mm -hmm. and like a feeling arises mm -hmm. as opposed to an aha idea. You know? Yeah, so and I I, te I tend to be more like that with you guys because I feel safe. So like when I'm doing like like 
super, I don't know, kind of less family style. I think it was more family style. It's like, I'll have this whole like five pages of, you know, bullet points. And I'm just like running through them really linear, lots of information. And it's, it's, again, it's that balance of like reading the, reading the field and like what, what's the moment of mind right now. But it's true. And I have a title for the talk. It just popped into my mind. Um, and it's totally not linear. Um, the finger pointing at the moon. Because we, we started with the Vesak moon, and we're ending with the candle. And it's like, yeah, it's all just the finger pointing at the moon. But we have to connect with the finger. Otherwise, we can't. We're like, where is it? I couldn't find the moon when I first met last night. There were clouds moving. I didn't know what direction I was facing. I wasn't at home. Like, where the heck is this thing? And in Guli Mala, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. That's a whole other part of the story, right? In Guli Mala, when he killed people, he... Um, he took up, uh, you know, a prize, right? A finger. And he had a necklace of fingers. <laughs> 99 fingers. The Buddha was supposed to be number 100. <laughs> so yes, the finger pointing at the mirror. I think we got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Thank well, you for doing the recording. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think we will go ahead and thank you so much, Heather. Yeah. It's always a, a pleasure to have you here. Can't wait for you to come back. Uh, I'll be back always in the winter, it. I think. I Absolutely. think we got it. Great. Can we do a circle for the clothes? We will. Okay. We're into these little now. We're, oh, we're yeah, yeah. Now it's a meditation. You always have to do these <laughs> this is This is a really important meditation. It's mindfulness of how you take in information. Watch your mind. Oh, okay. Bored, angry, stressed, interested, excited. Watch. It's good meditation. Thank you. Uh, next week, uh, we will have open discussion. And it's the Memorial Day weekend, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and which brings me to another part here, which is Donna. And Donna is the Pali word for generosity and forgiving. And uh, the suggested donation is 7 to $10. But please only give what you can comfortably give. It is to uh, be for our speakers, for the Larkin Street dinners, for the event here, for mailers and other things that come up for the Sangha. So we will handle that during the social hour. And um, Jim is our host today, if we can hear from you. I'm your host. There's tea available. If you use a uh, cup, just please wash it. There are snacks out there, uh, including chocolate cupcakes. People in this group love chocolate for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else am I supposed to say? I'm kind of blanking here. People sometimes meet after at uh, 1230 at the door. Uh, if you are not on our mailing list, please sign up to be on our mailing list with your email and physical address. And I'll be going around with Donna Bowl to collect the donations. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I believe next week is also Mardi Gras. Oh, it, I, I don't know. <coughs> is it a a carnival? A carnival. A carnival. Oh, it's a Mardi Gras, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you're driving here um, next week, forget it. Mm -hmm. I'm not a bar. True. Okay, thank you for that. That's great. Yeah, there's another way to give Donna to the Sangha. We have an account at Community Thrift on Valencia, right across from the police station at 18. <laughs> and uh, you, anything you give them, just tell them it's of a GBF, and we get it for a portion of the proceeds. But check the website, because as long as what they don't take, that might not be obvious. But right. uh, that's another way to support us. Cool. Thank you. Tom? So I just heard from uh, the publisher of uh, Queer Dharma 1 and 2 that they have four more cases <laughs> in storage that we have to get uh, by the by next weekend, or they'll go to the shredder. They're closing down all their storage and everything like that. So I just um, need someone with a car. Well, actually, I have I have a borrow truck, but somebody with a strong back that you know can help with these things so that we can get those. And um, anyway, if, if that's you, uh, or you'd like to help, just see me afterwards. Thank you. Any other announcements? Um, not to put you on the spot, but I don't have the usual um, the dedication of merit in front of me. Can you do a dedication? Oh, yeah, sure, of course. Excellent. I love Thank dedication of merit. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now it's oh, yeah. totally out. I didn't, I get to take your clock, too. That's so. Okay. <laughs> So
So let's take a moment of silence to, to bear witness and awareness for all those on this planet that are regularly not being held in the kind of respect and being seen that they deserve, either individually or in communities. And in this moment of bearing witness, we can also bear witness to the light of awareness, which can bear witness, our own awakeness. And really treasuring that, even if we don't know what it means. And then one of my favorite dedications is, is call and response. I like to hear our voices together. So you're welcome to join or not, as you wish. May all beings receive the blessings of my life. May all beings receive the blessings of my life. May I receive the blessings of my life. May I receive the blessings of my life. May, I receive the blessings of my life. May those I love receive the blessings of my life. May those I love receive the blessings of my life. May those I do not love receive the blessings of my life. May those I do not love receive the blessings of my life. May all those in this circle receive the blessings of my life. May all those in this circle receive the blessings of my life. May all beings receive the blessings of my life. May all beings receive the blessings of my life. So, thank you for uh, taking it out into the world that always needs it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, presence. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.